Hello, my name is Stephen Kamara, and welcome to Inside Fall River. Today, my guest is Al Lima. Al is well known in the community uh, with many hats, uh, someone who has uh, particularly distinguished himself in support of neighborhoods and in historic preservation. And today, Al is here to talk about the Community Preservation Act. Uh, an issue that uh, will be voted on in the November election. And uh, Al, why don't you begin by, uh, first of all, welcome and thank you for being here. And tell us a little bit about what the Community Preservation Act is. Hmm. Well, thank you, Steve, for inviting me to be here today. The Community Preservation Act is essentially a, a state law that allows communities to assess themselves to preserve those assets that communities most value. Um, and what it does, it, it allows communities to um, uh, assess themselves a certain percent, up to 3% of, um, of uh, real estate taxes to pay for things like uh, preserving architectural building, historic architecture, uh, open space, uh, build recreational facilities or rebuild them, uh, and generally to uh, preserve or enhance those quality of life issues and, uh, that uh, generally get taken out of a budget in, for most communities. And why do you think that Fall River needs this uh, Community Preservation Act enacted? Yeah. Well, Fall River in particular, I think, needs this, this, uh, the Community Preservation Act because basically the, uh, the enhancement of parks, uh, protection of historic structures doesn't get included in the budget. Uh, it gets cut out of the budget. So uh, as a result, we generally don't get the, uh, um, the, the maintenance or, or the, the, the upkeep of the parks that, that we should get. In addition to parks, what kinds of projects do you anticipate might benefit from a CPA established? Well, the city is one of the largest uh, owners of historic properties in the city, uh, such as the armory and the library and such. And so those, those buildings would be eligible for uh, CPA funds. But also there's a lot of open, small open spaces and neighborhoods that could be protected. Uh, where the city owns 26 parks and playgrounds, and those need to be upgraded. Uh, the CPA doesn't pay for maintenance, but it does pay for the capital improvements for those uh, recreational facilities. And who makes the determination on what gets funded and what doesn't get funded? Well, that's a good question. Uh, the state law mandates that there be a community preservation committee formed after the referendum is, is held. And the committee basically takes input from the public and public officials and um, makes recommendations to the city council. And then the city council will have the final say as to which projects actually get funded. So the committee itself doesn't make the actual decision. It's the city council that has final authority? Yes. Uh, only the city council has final authority, very much like the current uh, budget situation that we have now where the mayor recommends a budget and the city council approves. In this case, the community preservation committee will make the recommendations and the city council will approve. Okay, and how much would this cost uh, the average homeowner? You and I are both uh, property owners. What is uh, the anticipated cost to us as property owners? Yeah. Well, the, the average uh, homeowner, uh, the average house uh, value is about 215000 in the city. And for someone with a house of that value, they would pay about $19 a year, or about $4.75 per tax quarter, okay. So, which isn't all that much money. And that money uh, then would be geared to this uh, committee then for expenditure? Yes, and those funds have to go only uh, into, uh, for, for uses that are approved by the uh, state act, the community, they can't be used for other purposes, can't be used for maintenance, can't be taken out to be used for staffing or other things like that. And are there any exemptions uh, to property owners? Yes, there's a significant, uh, exemption. For instance, uh, someone with a, a house valued at 215000 would have $100,000 taken off the value of that. So the 1.5% would only be assessed on the 115000 remaining after that 100000 is taken off. And then there's also low and moderate income exemptions for persons making under a certain amount and seniors making under a certain amount would be exempt from the CPA. Entirely? Uh, if they're under a certain uh, income level, a household of two uh, making 50000 uh, could file for an exemption, and household of uh, two for elderly uh, could, 
could uh, also file. And they, they, I think, were allowed to make uh, up to uh, 60000 and then could, could file for an exemption. What kind of impact do you see this having on our city's economy and job creation? Well, two things. First of all, in, in the short term, uh, the, the, there's, uh, there would be an influx of anywhere between $1 and $10 million coming into the community. Uh, from uh, CPA funds and the funds that CPA um, matches, generates. So uh, that would result in a direct job creation uh, in new construction jobs and the spin-off that results from that uh, from, for you know, construction workers by working lo uh, or uh, patronizing local restaurants and things like that. But then there's also the long-term impact, too, of improving the, the quality of... of uh, of the city in terms of having better parks, having our historic properties uh, being maintained. Um, anything that makes the city looks better, makes it more attractive to future uh, businessmen who want to move here, makes it more attractive for tourism, and generally just improves the image of the city. Now, there's no doubt that people that are watching this are saying, well, certainly the city gets a lot of money from state and federal funding, uh, as well as local tax, uh, property tax, uh, being generated. Doesn't the city get enough money locally and through the state and federal governments? Why do we need this? Well, the city d does get quite a bit, but it doesn't really get enough because it usually doesn't have the matching funds to, uh, and all, almost all state grants require matching funds. A good example is North Park, where the city uh, had gotten a state grant to re uh, restore the second phase of South Park, but didn't have $73,000 for the match. And so we, the match was taken away. We went to some other community. And I think time and time again, the city doesn't budget the, the match for these funds and doesn't have the, the funding. And so therefore, this matching the state and federal funds go elsewhere. So I think that CPA would provide a reliable source of matching funds that would leverage a, quite a bit more. That million dollars that we would get from CPA every year would, would leverage anywhere between one and $10 million every year. Additional funding. Additional funding. Mm -hmm. Now, can local elected officials, you say this goes before the city council, uh, could they divert the funds to other, other uh, interests or other expenditures? No. Uh, the state law says that CPA funds have to be used for uh, historic preservation, open space and recreation, and neighborhood revitalization, and, and that's all. And the Department of Revenue monitors this very closely. So. Um, there'd be very little chance that uh, the money could be diverted, or no chance at all, frankly. Now, I know that some critics have said that uh, private property owners are going to be benefiting from this. Their, their houses are going to be improved by this. Is that true? Yeah, that, that, I've heard that also. And uh, the, the state law does allow private property uh, owners to, um, to receive CPA funds only if there's an overriding public interest. Uh, if, if uh, for instance, a very significant house in a town that, that uh, the townspeople want to preserve and that's owned by, still being occupied by a family. That could happen. Uh, but the city council has already signaled that uh, it, it really won't approve projects like that. Uh, and when projects uh, um, of that nature are approved, some, uh, the person has to put a uh, preservation restriction uh, uh, on their property to prevent it from being mm -hmm. used. So there's that public benefit that accrues. Now, I know we've talked about preservation uh, of historic properties. We've talked also about park creation and improvements in historic parks. Uh, but there is also a housing component. Uh, what is the housing component as it relates to the Community Preservation Act? Yeah. Well, the housing component was included in, in the Community Preservation Act. It wasn't there originally. Uh, basically to prevent suburban communities and towns from um, u using CPA funds to prevent affordable housing from coming into the towns. So they require that 10% of the um, amount of CPA funds be used towards housing. I see it being used to revitalize neighborhoods, to take those um, properties that are really in, uh, uh, deteriorated and blighting uh, and bringing down a neighborhood and taking CPA money and revitalizing them so that uh, the neighborhood benefits overall. So would likely it be money that might be able to be channeled, for instance, into a community development agency that does home rehabilitation? Yes, and, and that's typically what, what the funds have been used for. Mm -hmm. Well, let's talk a little bit about um, 
the state's influence in the process. This is state legislation uh, that we would be adopting. What control does the state have in telling the city on how it might spend this money? Well, there's a state law, the Community Preservation Act, which basically says what the money can be spent for and the conditions under which it operates. And uh, it's all laid out uh, and very straightforward. And over the years, it's been refined. 148 communities have already adopted the CPA in the 12 years since it's been in existence. So um, the, it's been fairly fi fine-tuned, and there are no surprises. The state isn't going to tell the community what kind of housing it should uh, put CPA funds into or anything like that. It just says that uh, if, if you use CPA money, these are the guidelines that you need to follow. Well, as we begin to wrap up our, our program today, I want, wanted you to focus a little bit on the percentage uh, that you had spoken about. Currently, the proposal that's before the voters in November, on November 6th, is a 1.5% uh, surcharge. Can this surcharge be increased, or decreased for that matter, uh, by any authority? Yes, it can. Um, it can be increased or decreased, as you've mentioned, uh, by a half a percent or more. Uh, up to 3%, it can be increased or decreased down to a half a percent. Um, and uh, many communities have, have, or some communities have, have done that. Uh, the way it happens is that it would happen in the same way as originally adopted. The city council will have to uh, recommend that it go to a ballot, it would go to a ballot, and then the citizens would have to vote it in. So it's only the citizenry that can make a change if this is adopted yes. on November 6th. Yes, and that's a good point. Okay. Uh, can a community eventually opt out of the CPA? If Fall River adopts this on November 6th and two years from now decides it just doesn't want to play in this game any longer, can the city opt out of this program? It can. Uh, the state law, though, says that it has to wait five years before it does. But after five years and any year, the city can opt out. And tell me a little bit about experiences in other communities. How have other communities either benefited or not benefited from this uh, kind of effort? Well, it, it varies uh, according to the community and what their priorities are. In uh, some of the rural towns, their priority has been to preserve open space and preserve the character of their community. Uh, in some of the more populous towns, the funding has gone for historic preservation, but also for park improvements. Um, bike paths, I mean, there are so many things that the CPA funds have, have been used for, but uh, it's, um, it's really become very popular for those communities that have adopted it. Mm -hmm. uh, it's been very popular and uh, a big asset to those communities. Well, in the remaining uh, time that we have, I'd like you, you to address specifically how can people get involved if they want to help out in this effort? And what do people need to do, particularly between now and November 6th? And what do they need to do on November 6th? Well, what they need to do on November 6th is to vote for the CPA because uh, it, it's a great, it would be a great benefit to the city of Fall River. Um, and before then, I think the main thing that people can do is to um, talk up the issue, educate themselves about the issue, uh, talk it up, get involved uh, in ways, or there are various ways that they can get, get involved. But mostly um, get them and their families uh, to the um, to uh, the polling booth and uh, vote for CPA. Is there any website or any telephone number for people that might want to support this effort? Yes, uh, if, if you uh, Google Fall River CPA, our website will, will uh, come up and we have a Facebook page as well. And that provides a lot of uh, questions and answers on CPA and a good education for anyone who really wants to find out more about the CPA. Well, thank you, Al Lemer, and we want to thank you viewers for uh, joining us here at Inside Fall River. We look forward to your return at our next segment. Welcome to Inside Fall River. I'm Wendy Garflip from United Neighbors. My guests today are from Child and Family Services, Melissa St. Pierre, the program coordinator of the Young Parents Support Program, and Lauren Mancini, the program director from the Therapeutic Mentoring Program. Welcome, Melissa and Lauren. Thank Welcome. you. Thank you for having us. So let's start out. Tell me a little bit about Child and Family Services. What do you do? How long you've been around? What kind of things are the supports that you offer to the community? Well, actually, Child and Family Services is one of the oldest nonprofit organizations in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. 
We've been around since 1843, um, started out as an orphanage for children less homeless during the whaling era. Um, today, Child and Family Services continues to grow, um, respond to the needs of the families in the community. We have over 450 employees with offices in Cape Cod, Plymouth, um, Florence, we're in Worcester, Somerville. Um, and Fall River. Lawrence, Fall River, and New Bedford. Um, we have four um, fully operational mental health clinics. Uh, we have emergency services both in New Bedford and um, in Plymouth, which is a, a recent opening for us. Brandon. I'm very proud of that. We have a CBAT unit in New Bedford. And um, we also offer CBHI services both in Fall River and in New Bedford and on the Cape. Okay, okay so yes. what's CBHI? Uh, CBHI is actually um, the Children's Behavioral Health Institute. And they're um, three years old. We're gone into our third year of offering these services. And we offer them both in Fall River, New Bedford, and on the Cape. And they're actually a result of a lawsuit that was filed against the state of Massachusetts, um, which alleged that the Mass Health um, basically wasn't meeting the needs of children with serious emotional disturbance. And as a result of that, um, the state was um, had to offer services to these children. So about three years ago, um, the in, the CBHI services came about and in-home therapy and therapeutic mentoring services, which we offer here in Fall River, and a number of other services um, were started. And um, the, the, the basic principle of these services, Wendy, are to keep children home in their communities. Previous to that, these children would have been placed in residential. They would have been isolated from their communities, from their schools, from their friends. So now these children are serviced here in their communities with their families um, and kept in their school systems. So it's great. Um, it exactly. really works well. Right. We all know that it's better for a child to be at home than it is for a child to be isolated mm -hmm. in a residential program. Right. Uh, absolutely. Right. And a lot of times when these children were placed so far out of their communities, their families couldn't be a part of their services because of transportation right. issues. Right. And we certainly understand that in Fall River with busing that stops at 6 o'clock at night <laughs> isn't available on absolutely. the weekends. That Can you imagine not being able to go see your child at a residential program? all weekend long because you had no way to get there. Absolutely. Right. right. So this sounds like CBHI. Can you tell me what the acronym stands for again? Sure, sure. Children's Behavioral Health Institute. Children's Behavioral Health Institute. Well, it certainly sounds like a, an idea whose time has come a long time ago, and we're glad that it's in. Absolutely. So you mentioned something about um, therapeutic mentoring. Can you tell us a little bit more about Correct. what that means? Therapeutic mentoring is a one-on-one -on -one structured service between a child and a therapeutic mentor and they work on goals of social skills, communication skills, daily living skills. And the therapeutic mentor receives a treatment plan from an outpatient clinician or an in-home therapist or an intensive care coordinator. So it's not a standalone service. It's driven by a clinical hub, as we call it. Mm -hmm. So it's not a service where a parent can like call me up and say, you know, Ms. Mancini, I would like to refer my child. They have to be referred through a clinical hub. So if there's a family out there listening right now that says, gee, that would be a great service for my family, they could certainly make a phone call to me if their child's not currently involved with one of those services, and I can help them find that level of care to get involved. And what actually happens at therapeutic mentoring? So what we do, say that there was a goal of uh, making a connection in, in the community and working on social skill development. We would, through coaching and support, through some skill building, through some interventions that we have, we would help that child develop those skills to increase their functioning and become better at that skill. And how long a period of time does a child stay involved with therapeutic mentoring? Depending on what we're working on, it can be anywhere from six months to a year. And is there an age limitation? It's from zero to 21. Wow, so you're really dealing with infants and toddlers Absolutely. and elementary school, high school, all across the board. We work within daycare centers, we work within the school systems, we work at home, in the community, wherever the need is. Great. So Lauren, we've been ignoring you. Tell me a little, uh, uh, Melissa, I'm sorry, we've been ignoring you. Tell me a little bit about the parent support program that you run. The Young Parent Support Program um, that I run is run both in Fall River and New Bedford. 
We service young families under the age of 24. Um, it, it's not child dependent as where some programs um, in the area, it, you have to be a first time parent to be able to be eligible for their programming or the child has to be under the age of three. Our program has no other limitations other than the fact that the family has to be under the age of 24. Both parents, if they are both parents. If it, We will work with the, the either parent. parent that is under 24 and we work with the entire family when we do work with our families. Um, our program has an outreach worker that goes out to visit in the home or wherever the family is comfortable. If the home's not um, the most comfortable place for them to be seeing anyone, we'll meet them at McDonald's, at a park, um, whatever suits the family the best. So we go out and we work on parenting skills, parenting education. We also deal with crisis management, things like um, evictions, um, the loss of heat, just basic needs of the family in order to make sure that they're functioning at the level that they need to function to provide the best care for the, that they can for their child or infant. Um, we provide parenting groups in um, YPS. So we have parenting groups both in Fall River and New Bedford. We offer them usually about eight to 12 weeks. Um, I also go out into the community. I do a parenting group at Durfee High School and I work with the parents at Durfee High School every Friday with one of the um, school adjustment counselors over there. Okay, and is that for parents of students or parents and students as well? That's for the students that are enrolled at Durfee who are parents themselves. I see. Um, so I work at Durfee generally, they're 19 and under, um, but it's all the students that are enrolled at Durfee that are going to school, most of them full time, they're working, um, and they're, they're reaching that goal of getting their high school diploma, which is incredible. So what are some of the skills that are discussed and taught at your Young Parent Support program? At our program, we teach um, proper ages and stages of development, something that we Very focus cool. on a lot is um, healthy nutrition and feeding of children. There is um, a big discrepancy and misunderstanding, I think, when um, parents start with formula or how to breastfeed. Breastfeeding support is huge within our program. Um, but there's a misunderstanding, I think, that children develop a lot more quickly and the guidelines within the f through the physicians change daily as to what they can and cannot have, when formula starts, when formula ends, when they can start feeding jarred food, solid foods. Um, so we do a lot of support around that. We do a lot of um, daily living skills, to be honest with you, teaching parents um, how to maintain their home in order to keep it safe for their children, make sure that their children are, are kept up and clean, that they're enrolling their four-year-olds into a school program that um, any sort of child care needs that they need for their children as far as daycare, Head Start. Um, we link them up with all of the community resources available to that family, fuel assistance. So we teach them how to access community services in order to better. That's great. And we provide. do know how important it is for parents to learn how to make their homes safety proof for their children. Yes. We had a tragic accident a couple of weeks ago here in, in town with a child that went through a screen mm -hmm. and perished. Mm -hmm. And uh, we know that something as simple as opening windows from the bottom, from the top rather than from the exactly. bottom, or putting mm -hmm. up window guardrails um, would, would have, you know, can prevent these kind of accidents. But I don't think we think about those things. So I think it's wonderful that this is part of your curriculum. I think mm -hmm. what happens mm -hmm. is you bring a baby home and you're sort of home. You don't think about what your house has to be like and what you need to change to facilitate that child. Right. So that's great. That's really good. Okay, so what other services are available through uh, Child and Family Service? Well, here in Fall River, um, just along the lines of the CBHI services, we also offer in-home therapy, which is a model that works with a master's level clinician as well as a therapeutic and training specialist. And they work with the issues, the mental health issues of the identified child in the family and how it impacts the family. So a little bit different than the therapeutic mentoring where that works more with you know the social functioning of the child. And that's a referral where it doesn't require a clinical hub. A parent can actually call up and refer themselves. Mm -hmm. So that's an excellent service. So before you go any further, tell us where they're calling. How can they access you? They, they can call the Fall River office at 508-676-5708. Uh, and they can ask um, for myself, Lauren Mancini, for any of the CBHI services, and I can direct them to the appropriate coordinator for that service. Okay, say that number again, slowly. 508-676-5708. Five, five oh Great, so now you can go back to what you were saying about services. Um, kind of. And we also offer... Um, Ad Adoption Journeys, yep. which is a post-adoptive service. It's unique in the, in the state, and our 
Um, our site houses. What's post-adoptive services mean? Once an adoption is finalized, um, the service comes in and they provide respite care support to ensure that the, the adoption stays intact. So, um, and, children. And that, and that adoption has to be sponsored by um, DCS. The state. It's a guardianship or an adoption that has been sponsored by the Department, Department of Children, children and Families. families. Mm -hmm. right. And they offer a wonderful service. Right, so they um, have case managers that go out and work with the families. Adopt adopted families have unique needs. They're not, um, they're, they're unique to just adoptive families and what the children need, what um, identified reactive attachment disorder. They work um, directly okay, with that. Back. Reactive attachment disorder. Let's have a little clarification about what that means. <laughs> what, that, children often, when they've gone through the, um, the the placement, the, uh, the loss issues, the trauma issues of going through that process often have unique needs and issues and it makes it difficult for them to bond to families. So it's a specialized need and a specialized way of dealing with children. Great. Right. And they're, they're trained specifically in reactive or RAD, reactive attachment disorder. Um, but they provide these families with um, other families, like themselves, they go out on different activities, they provide great, great services. They just did an activity at Breezy this week, as a matter of fact, Monday. They went to a place called Breezy in Douglas, Mass, and it, they had a great picnic. There's water slides, it's a beach, and all the families come together. So you meet other adoptive families. Um, kids don't feel so isolated who right. are adopted. Right. And um, the social connections for families great. is it's one of great. the protective factors that we all know exactly. help build strong families. Okay, before, before we end, I did want to ask you, you had mentioned something to me about the work you do with teen pregnancy. Can you talk mm -hmm. a little bit about that? Teen pregnancy. Um, we're currently, the agency itself just became part of an initiative, the MPPTI initiative, which is a Mass Pregnant and Parenting Teen Initiative. Um, and YPS is actually building off some of that information that we're learning through that program. It was a grant that we wrote last year. Um, and it talks about prevention for parents. We have the 12th highest teen birth rate as of 2009 in Fall River. The 12th highest teen birth 12th rate. 12th highest. New Bedford has the fifth. Um, Quite the dubious honor. <laughs> I suppose, considering Massachusetts as a whole has a very low teen birth rate. Um, we are exceedingly high within the United States where we stand right now. Um, so there have been a lot of initiatives pushing, to, pushing towards prevention, um, abstinence programming, um, a new prep grant that just came into the city. Um, but none of them work directly with those teens who are already parenting, who we know are already active, who are out there, who have had children, and the, the risks and the potentials for them to have another child quickly is so incredibly high. Even within YPS, um, we've seen so many repeat pregnancies in the past six years. Um, so we're focusing a big piece on prevention for these parenting families, who we know are active making sure that they're um, utilizing some sort of birth control, educating them on birth control, educating them on the cost of um, the financial literacy that goes around raising a child. That sounds terrific. So I want to thank you both, Melissa and Lauren for Child and Family Service for coming and being on Inside Full River. I'm Wendy Garflip. Thank you for listening.